Hello, I'm Tim Smith, the pastor of the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church located here in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And wherever you're watching us from today, we're delighted to have you with us for this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, we are approaching Holy Week and Easter. Next Sunday will be Palm Sunday. And as we begin to prepare ourselves for Holy Week and its events and the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we need to begin to look at some of the events that led to Jesus' walk to Calvary. Some of those important events that took place in those final days. And if we were to preach a sermon on each and every one of them, we probably would put hundreds on YouTube. However, today I want us to focus upon one of the important events that took place in the final hours of Jesus' earthly ministry before his arrest by the temple authorities. We hear these words from John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. Then he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and returned to the table. He said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for this is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline its hearing to our hearts, our minds, and its application to our lives today. You know, Jesus knew that he was approaching the end of his ministry. Whether he knew it was going to happen that day or just in the next few or exactly every detail is left unknown to us, but he certainly knew that the end was very close and he knew even one in the very room, one of his close followers would betray him. Now, he knew his time on this earth was short and that leads me to ask us this question. What would you do today if you knew today was your last day in this existence? If you knew that tomorrow or tonight you were going to leave this world to go to be in the presence of God, what would you do? 
I think first and foremost, we would want to be sure our souls were in order and that we were at peace with our creator. We probably would want to spend some time in prayer and be double sure everything was where it needed to be. I also think there would probably be some loose ends to tie up. We might want to make sure all our paperwork is in order, beneficiaries and wills and all those things taken care of. And we might even want to uh, make a list or arrange things in a way where it would be easier for our relatives to find uh, various things they would need after our passing. We might even take some time to drot, jot down our funeral arrangements. But what would we do past that? I think most of us would want to soak up every moment of this life, even as broken and as messed up as it is, we do know that it does bring us some joys. We would probably want to spend quite a bit of time with our family and close friends. This is exactly what Jesus did. He gathered with his disciples in the upper room and shared a meal with them. And I think we can understand that. It might be easy to invite everyone to meet us for supper tonight out at a restaurant. Or maybe to invite them over to our home for uh, a family type meal, get together, a little party of sorts. And this would give us an opportunity to see everyone for a last time. But would we be quick to clean everything up? Would we be the first in line to wash the dishes and to clean up the house as the get-together wound down? Probably not. Most of us would figure it wouldn't matter if the dishes were clean or dirty because we would not want to waste our final minutes or hour or so on this earth doing such things. We could leave that for somebody else. Our heirs could worry about cleaning that once we were gone. We would want to focus on ourselves and the things we might enjoy doing or uh, feel like would bring us some joy or happiness and renew some of our friendships and our relationships and our memories of one another. We probably wouldn't want to spend our time waiting on everyone else. Yet, notice what Jesus did. He gathered with his disciples and close followers in the upper room, and there they are going to partake of a great meal together that we know now as the Last Supper. But two things stand out in the events in that room when it comes to what Jesus did. That is that Jesus served the disciples. In his last times, in his last day, Instead of focusing on himself and his own interest, he spent his time serving other people. Now, we see this in two ways. One, it is Jesus that serves the food. It's Jesus that passes the cup. It's Jesus that takes the bread and breaks it and serves it to the disciples. But the greatest way that he shows his service is by washing the feet of his disciples. Now, I know that we live in the 21st century, and foot washing is somewhat foreign to us, especially in the biblical understanding of it. We've heard about it. We've read about it. And a few of you may have participated in it. Now, I must admit that I have never participated in foot washing. Uh, when I was in seminary once, there were people there of different faith traditions, and I know one particular group, uh, they gathered together and did wash feet in one of the services, but I did not join in. I must admit I was reluctant to do so and was a little unsure of what all might be involved and how things might happen, and I just have to be honest about it, probably for the same reason many of you have not joined in to foot washing is it's Something that takes us out of our comfort zone, doesn't it? The whole idea of doing it makes us uncomfortable to wash someone else's feet. 
That's hard for us to do. It's tough. We read about it. We hear of others doing it, but few of us are lining up to have the experience. Now, it's important to give a little background on foot washing in Bible times. We remember it was a time in which people wore sandals. The fact was that the roads were dusty, dirty, and often the feet would become very dirty after one walked a great distance. It was common when one approached someone's house that there would be a wash basin near the door where the feet could be washed. And if I was coming to your house, I was expected to wash my own feet before I entered. After all, who would want to bring all the dirt and grime up into their house? But if you went to a big shot's house, a rich person's house, they didn't wash your feet, but you didn't have to wash them yourself either. Their servants would wash your feet. And so we see something important. Always the person of lower standing washed the person of higher standing's feet. If an important person came to your house, you would wash their feet. But if someone of the same rank came, you didn't wash their feet. And certainly you would never wash the feet of someone of lower standing than yourself. Now, I know we don't like to talk about the idea of social standing in the church because as Christians, we are to be a classless society. There are to be no elites in the church, no big shots in the church. There's no middle class or poor or rich in the church. We're all the same, aren't we? The Bible teaches us that we are all children of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And no matter how large or small our homes or our bank accounts are, no matter our race, our ethnicity, our gender, or anything else about us, we are all equal. It's level at the foot of the cross. But we also live in the world, do we not? We still exist in the real world with all its brokenness, and we know about class, classes, can't even talk today, <laughs> classes in society. We know that some people by social standings are higher than others. And because of that, they are treated differently. Maybe because of their last name or what family they're from or what job title they have or have had or maybe due to their wealth or their background. But here we see that Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Yet Jesus is the important one. Jesus is the one that's of higher standing, yet in his final hours on this earth, he gets down on his hands and knees and washes the feet of the disciples. The point he is making is dramatic. And it shows us that this was on his mind in his final hours, that he wanted to be sure we understood this. He wanted to be sure that we got it. And that is that we were to serve other people. The whole idea of washing another person's foot makes us uncomfortable. And we pull away from it and try not to get involved in it. And it is that very reaction that Jesus is trying to make his point with. The fact is, it's not easy to wash another person's feet. It requires us to humble ourselves. It requires us to give up our selfishness and to love and to serve the other person. And Jesus shows us this lesson in such a great way. We see here the Messiah the Savior, God in the flesh, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, whatever term or title we want to use for Jesus, we see him wash the feet of his disciples. It's amazing, isn't it? 
Jesus is holy. Jesus is perfection itself. Jesus is awesome. Yet he washes the feet of sinners, of disciples that have lacked faith at times, disciples that have disappointed him from time to time. You remember once he sent them out to preach and they came back and they had failed in their mission. Many times Jesus would try to tell them things and they didn't understand it. They didn't even understand why he was washing their feet. This was an amazing thing and Peter tries to stop him because Peter's saying, this isn't natural, this isn't right. If anybody's going to wash anybody's feet, we need to wash your feet. You're our leader, you're the teacher, you're the savior of the world, you're the Lord. We need to wash your feet, not you wash us, but Jesus insists, doesn't he? Because he wants to make the point crystal clear. We are to serve others. That means we have to serve people that are imperfect, people that disappoint us, people that let us down, people that are flawed themselves, just as Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. You know, it's hard to serve someone that maybe deep down we think we're better than or we're more holy than or more righteous than or better than but we must put those things aside because those things do not matter at all jesus is better than any of us he is the greatest person that has ever lived yet he humbled himself to wash the feet of disciples that he knew that very night we're going to abandon him and run away from him in his hour of need. And he even tells them this. And they don't understand what he's speaking of. But you know, I want us to look just a little deeper into this idea of washing feet. We're told that Jesus washed the feet of all his disciples. All twelve Judas Iscariot. Yes, Jesus washed Judas' feet. <laughs> Jesus was well aware already that Judas was the one that was going to betray him. Because after Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he made the statement, we read it this morning from Scripture in the 13th chapter of John. He made the statement, that even though you are all washed, not all are clean. That was a reference to Judas, who, while he had not yet accepted payment for betraying his Lord, he had already put the plan in place. He had talked with the authorities and had made arrangements for when the time was right to betray our Lord. Later in the meal, we're told that Jesus told John that he would show him who it was because he would dip the bread in his sauce. And he dipped it in Judas's sauce. So Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. This man he had spent the past three years with and helped so much. Man he had tried to teach, one he had loved. They had been through much together. But now he was going to turn on him. You know, I, I don't know how Jesus could wash his feet. How could you wash the feet of someone that's about to stab you in the back? It's one thing if you didn't know it, but Jesus clearly knew it. Now, I don't like to bring up bad things for us to think about in our sermons. I'm trying to uplift us a little bit, if possible. But just for a moment, let us think of the person that has mistreated us the most in our life could be a family member that did us wrong or cut us off could be a person we went to school with that ragged us and bullied us and aggravated us for years 
It could be that co-worker that knocked us out of that promotion that we should have gotten or that raise. There are a lot of folks like that, sadly. But think of the one that has mistreated you the most. Now imagine washing their feet. Yeah, yeah, that's what Jesus did. Judah sold him out, yet he washed his feet. It's hard enough to wash the feet of a friend, but imagine washing one of your betrayer. Surely, if Jesus could do that, Surely if Jesus and all of his greatness and all of his awesomeness and all of his holiness could humble himself to wash the feet of his disciples, we can humble ourselves to be of service to other people. Jesus says that we are to wash one another's feet just as he washed their feet. We are to serve others just as Jesus has served us. You know, that's the thing about foot washing. We could get together and carry it out, have a foot washing service, and I'm sure it would be edifying to the Lord, and we probably would gain some new insight from it, help us to more appreciate this passage of Scripture, if nothing else, but I think we might still miss the full point. The point isn't about foot washing itself. The purpose is about serving others. The purpose is about getting out of our comfort zones. The message is about us putting our pride aside, our interest aside, our life aside, and putting someone else's first. That's what Jesus did. Even when he knew the end was at hand, that's how he spent his time serving others. And so, my friends, let us do the same, not just in our final hours, but always. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together this day. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we trust that all that has been said and done today has brought glory to your name. Please forgive us of our sins and our selfishness. Open our hearts, our mind, our eyes, and our ears that we may see opportunities to be of service to others. Give us strength to be more humble, give us strength to put aside our selfish, centered ways and to serve you. We ask all this in the name of Christ, our risen Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Again, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We're located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway here in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And if you're in the Fayetteville area, we'd love to have you come worship with us. We have our 8.30 a.m. service, which is our a little bit more casual. It's in the Fellowship Hall, uh, a little bit different music. And then at 10.30, we have our traditional worship service here in the sanctuary. And whichever of those you think might interest you, we'd love to have you come and be with us. And may God bless you, and may you have a wonderful and safe week.